Hello, I'm Matt Teal, and welcome to the Military Tech Show. I'll be bringing you the latest in frontline and security high tech that could spell a radical future for armed forces all over the globe. Coming up on the show. Defending the world's harbours, the robot developed by the US and Sweden that's confronting an explosive new threat. Communicating in the deep how to track underwater drones. It's really a fake, the body simulator that can prepare medics for the worst of the war zone. And the world's first digital warship, the new French frigate that's ready for a fully connected age. The threat of improvised explosive devices on land is well known. We're all pretty familiar with the tracked robots that are rolled towards suspect devices. But an increasing area of concern is the threat to harbours and to shipping. Security agencies in many nations, including the United States, are concerned that harbours could become new targets for terrorists. That's why several American government agencies and Swedish manufacturer Saab have been developing the Sea Wasp. Sea Wasp is a remotely operated vehicle which has been developed between the US Combating Terrorism Technical Support Organization and Saab. We've been working together for the last two and a half years to deliver a vehicle which is able to counter the improvised explosive device threat under the water. Effectively, the vehicle will deliver the same capability that you will have seen land EOD, explosive ordnance disposal robots, do in places like Afghanistan. What you see in the water now is the result of that work. There are three main features that the vehicle brings. That's power, manoeuvrability and control. The power it has six thrusters on board, all electrically powered, and they're able to operate in up to two and a half knots of current, which is beyond the current that a diver can operate. Maneuverability, the uh, vehicle itself is able to fly in six, what we call six degrees of freedom. So it will fly like, a, like an aeroplane, and it can hold a hover in any attitude. And when you're dealing with a bomb, on the side of a ship, that's absolutely crucial. And the last thing is that control. The usual EOD operator is not an expert underwater ROV pilot. So we need to give him a vehicle which is relatively straightforward to control and the controls are relatively easy to operate and see what does that. And you'll see from the shots you've had in the water that it holds that station very easily. So if the operator is approaching a target, he sees the target and he wants to stop. If he takes his hand off the sticks, the vehicle will stop in the position that it was when you took your hand off the sticks. So when you get up close and you want to do something to the device, you're able to just inch it forward, literally, and then deal with the device and make it safe. The vehicle carries a number of sensors and tools so that you can first of all find the target and when you've found it, do something to it. The tools to find it consist of firstly a sonar. It's a wideband sonar operating out to a range of approximately 100 metres. So you can do an initial search in an area where you believe there might be a threat. Once you've localised that threat with the sonar, you can use two cameras which are carried on board. The first one is on the vehicle itself, has a, a pan tilt and a, a, a wide angle lens of about 120 degrees. So it will move left, right, up and down and that allows you to do your initial search. Then when you come in close to the target, 
there is a, another camera which is situated on the manipulator arm which is the tool that you use to tackle the target. The vehicle itself can then be fitted dependent on what the operator wants to do with the relative tools for the job. We've been working as I said for the, on the project for two and a half years in all but uh, the actual build took 14 months uh, and we delivered uh, we were planning to deliver one vehicle to the US but halfway through that 14 month period the US said that they wanted three vehicles and for the last nine months uh, we've been testing and evaluating or the US has been testing and evaluating those vehicles there's one with the US Navy in Norfolk Virginia one with the FBI in Los Angeles and one with the South Carolina Police Department in Charleston we're getting the feedback on that. The one you see here today is our fourth vehicle, which is for research and development and demonstration. So that prototype process will end and will then go into, into production of the production model. The vehicle actually isn't going to change a great deal. There are a few tweaks on software and some nice to have ease of mobility add-ons that we're going to include but in broad terms, it will remain pretty much the same. Navigation and location for unmanned vessels beneath the surface of the sea is a challenge. Without GPS, underwater drones can lose track of their exact positions. An inertial navigation system powered by cutting-edge fibre-optic gyroscopes can solve that problem, as I find out. So Olivier, just, just explain to me what we're looking at here. Okay, this is an autonomous underwater vehicle. What we do at XBlue, we deliver the navigation parts of this vehicle. So here we have an inertial navigation system called FINS Compact Series. It's very compact, very low power consumption, and very performing as well. It delivers the heading, roll, pitch, of the vehicle, the orientation of the vehicle, but also the position of the vehicle. This position, over time, will drift. And in order to reduce the drift and keep a very good uh, navigation, uh, we use acoustic. So we also have in this vehicle uh, a transponder, an acoustic transponder. That there, yeah? Yeah. That is linked with our global acoustic positioning system on the surface and will track the uh, AUV. So there are, there are two components to that, that yeah, system. Yeah, two components. The, the, inertia the, acoustic, uh, the acoustic system feeds uh, the inertial navigation system and compensates for the drift in time of the position. And it's all about, I guess, with a vehicle like this that is down there under the water on its own, not connected, not tethered to anything, it knowing where it is. Absolutely. This vehicle is completely autonomous. There is no cable between the vehicle and the surface. It's launched by a vessel and it goes for his mission, his survey mission, and obviously he, know, he needs to know perfectly where he is and where he needs to go. So what it, what it also needs is, is that gap system up on the surface, which is, which is over there. So you, Absolutely. Let's go and have a look at that, Olivier. What are we looking at here? So this is our gap system. This is a global acoustic positioning system. This is the antenna which is underneath the vessel mm -hmm. and that will track the transponder that we saw on the AUV. What it is is a ultra short baseline it measures a distance between the antenna, which is fitted below the vessel, and the transponder on the autonomous underwater vehicle. So this, this is underneath the vessel, basically? This is underneath the vessel. Um, there is an, a, a, sign, a um, signal emission, a sound emission, here from the center to the transponder, back here to the four legs, and we're going to measure time and phase difference and get the distance. This distance is then computed in the system. This system is linked with a GPS antenna, so we get an absolute position of where is the target, where is the autonomous underwater vehicle. I mean, it looks quite science fiction. It looks like something out of a movie. How high tech are the bits inside? How cutting edge is this bit of kit? It's, it's quite high technology indeed, because there is an inertial navigation system inside the acoustic antenna uh, these uh, inertial navigation systems 
allows the systems to be free of calibration. So you can take it, put it into the water, even in a very uh, small vessel, and uh, immediately use it and track your uh, targets. Well, that's it for part one, but still to come on the Military Tech Show, why realism is a good thing when it comes to training for war zones, and the concept submarine that could show how wars might be fought in the 2040s. Welcome back to the Military Tech Show, where we show you the equipment that the world's militaries will be using in the conflicts of tomorrow. Now, many soldiers and civilians owe their lives to the medical emergency response teams who deliver life-saving surgical procedures on the front line. Well, training combat medics and preparing them for the traumatic injuries they could see is vital. A researcher at Nottingham and Trent University has created a lifelike human casualty. And with that in mind, viewers should be aware that the fake casualty is highly realistic. Charlotte Banks reports. <laughs> On the front line in Helmand, Afghanistan, injured soldiers relied on this flying ambulance to get them back to hospital for treatment. The medics on board had to keep the most severely injured casualties alive, carrying out emergency operations that were often brutal, unfamiliar and virtually impossible to train for back in the UK where wounds from bullets, bombs and blasts are rare. The solution could be found here in a lab at Nottingham Trent University. Now, brace yourselves, this is not for the squeamish. This is Tony. He's a lifelike human replica made of silicon. He breathes and he bleeds. And one day, surgeons and other medics could practice on Tony to get used to the stress and the trauma of emergency operations. The body was cast from a real person by a specialist company, but the heart and lungs inside the chest cavity were created by technician Richard Arm. Using a combination of silicon gels and fibres and painstaking accuracy, the organs mimic a real patient to help train surgeons. You can communicate all types of chest trauma, different ways of delivering treatment, but also preparing people psychologically for seeing an open chest and understanding what a heart and lungs actually look like. Is it all right to now go inside and have a look at the organs? Mm. So um, the chest spreader will, will spread the, the cavity for us. And so this is a surgical to... instrument? It is, yep. Everything we, we use is, is all um, surgical grade stuff. So even the materials that we're using here, these are all surgical grade silicones. So um, what I can do here first, I'll, I'll just remove the heart first. Gosh, it's big, isn't it? Yeah, this is, this is a fairly large heart of, of a, a, a healthy, fit you know, soldier. He's a, he's a big lad. In Afghanistan, catastrophic bleeding quickly led to death. Doctors were often forced to open up a patient's chest like this to get at the major artery of the heart, called the aorta, to stop the bleeding. What we have to do is go in from the side, put your hand underneath the lungs, reach through and put your fingers and basically most of your hand on the aorta to press it down to stop the blood going to the legs. So if, um, if, the, if, the, if the soldier's been involved, or civilian even, been involved in an IED, um, commonly there's trauma to the legs. It's easy to see how this replica could help train medics for this type of extreme surgery. The lungs can also inflate and deflate as they do in life to give the impression the patient is breathing. Despite the white coat, Richard's background is in fact in the arts. These organs are really incredibly accurate sculptures, made to look and feel like the real thing. His research has been meticulous. He's examined CT scans from living people, watched post-mortems and had feedback from surgeons. So this is our 3D powder printer. We've been printing all night 
And now you can see the results of the print in here. He produces the organs in the lab using a 3D printer. I'll just explain a little bit about how the um, material is deposited. This bed controls um, the amount of powder being deposited in this bed. So this bed starts empty and this moves over back and forth depositing a layer of binder which binds the, pl the powder together um, based on what we've told it with the uh, scan data. So then it builds up this layer by layer to achieve this three-dimensional object. And here's the, the final piece. The coloration is added later using photos of real surgery for reference. Because this is a replica, it can be taken anywhere, even to the front line. You can train right from where he receives the injury. You can train the medical team all throughout, right till he gets to hospital and he's having the procedure done. So there's nothing currently which does that, which covers all of those bases in a way that communicates the fidelity of a real person. These models could transform how the field surgeons of tomorrow are prepared for battlefield trauma. Around the world, navies and manufacturers are trying to develop the next generation of warships and submarines. When it comes to underwater technology, French manufacturer DCNS has been showing off what it calls a concept sub. Like a concept car, it shows how submarines might look in 20 or 30 years. Well, meanwhile, on the surface, DCNS is already well beyond the concept stage. Elve, tell us what we're looking at here. Right here you are looking at the Bellara, which is the brand new new generation frigate built by DCNS to be the successor of the Lafayette class stealth frigate. Uh, she will be a full multi-mission warship dealing with above water and other water uh, warfares and she opens the new era of uh, digital warship at sea. So what does that actually mean practically, the new digital warship? Digital warship, that means that we have to face now, the Navy have to face a huge flow, data flow. So there is a new architecture to manage that and to concentrate the uh, power, computing power in different places to optimize the data flows and the presentation of the information to the operators. It is also well uh, prepared for cyber defense to identify, detect and prevent the ship against cyber threat. That threat of cyber attack is going to be so key, isn't it, going forward? What kind of features does this ship have to combat that threat? It's, it's really uh, an architecture uh, concept that uh, the ship will be prepared to identify, protect, detect the cyber threat and link to the shore base uh, cyber office to help the ship to manage these uh, new threats. Ships now are using equipment, digitalized equipment, they are connecting to each other, so cyber threat is a real concern for all navies. Talking through something else, what else have we got? What else can we see? In terms of maintenance, the ship will have brand new equipment, digitalized equipment, and uh, a centralized onboard diagnostic for the, uh, for the ship, linked to a shore base uh, office, who can manage the, the other data from the other ships and they share everything on a common, common time. They also, the ship will also manage the uh, predictive maintenance to optimize the cycle life of every equipment. Talk me through some of the other upgrades. Another upgrade, for example, the, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the combat bridge. Uh, inside the bridge, you, we find a dedicated room with a 360 degrees night and day vision digitalized all around the ship to manage the close protection of the ships. We have uh, an integrated mast with all the uh, rooms on board to manage these operational uh, data flows for the operator. And we have a very intuitive and user-friendly man-machine interface to help the operators to earn time on a very, very rapid uh, information transfer and for the decision making. Tell me more about what the experience will be like for those on board. How will it feel different to maybe ships they've been on before? That will be the technology of your iPhone. We address this ship to the new generation of sailors uh, who are used to uh, 
work and to live every day with a screen. We will propose them the same man-machine interface that the one they are using every day to facilitate for them the decision-making and the appropriation of the situation. When will we see it? We have to think about the future in DCNS right now to be ready for the future for the next generation. Uh, the first ship will be delivered in 2023, but to be ready to conceive the, this whole project uh, in 2023, it has to be thought now. So we have to be ahead of the technologies to be prepared to offer the new technologies in the future. A few yards away, one of Hervé's colleagues was helping us see further and deeper into the future. SMX 3.0 is a concept ship. It's a great showcase that able to DCNS uh, to explain what are the new capabilities offers to customer of submarines. Okay, so just give us a tour, show us around. What is very important for, for submariners, for example, is to be able to detect underwater. So she's fitted with a, a big sonar system. She's also fitted with a new energy system, air independent propulsion, uh, which allow to the submarine to stay uh, more than three weeks underwater to remain underwater for three weeks. Uh, that, that is a, a long period uh, under the water. Uh, she is also fitted with a, a brand new electric motor in order to save uh, electricity and to save energy. There is on board a, a brand new uh, ops room with a, a flat display everywhere. Tell me more about the inside, Stefan. Uh, for for example, accommodation on board the submarine is very, are very important. More space for the for people. Uh, it will be uh, more easy to live on board. Uh, they will have a, a better uh, spirit on board, and uh, people will, will be able to work a little bit more and a little bit more efficiency. Um, this this uh, submarine have, have been designed for uh, Generation Z people who will have uh, between 20 and 25 years old uh, in. 2020, 2025. We have a lot of data on board uh, because of digital uh, technology. We have to treat it and to save it, uh, to store it on a, a big data system. Do you think it's possible that a ship like this will ever be built? Yes, maybe like a concept car. Maybe not today. Maybe some part will be more interesting for our customer, for some Navy. Uh, maybe some other uh, will be uh, uh, forgotten. Unmanned vehicles could help armed forces all over the world save lives and money. For navies, combining unmanned underwater, surface and airborne vehicles could help save lives in a world where concern for personnel is growing. Exercise Unmanned Warrior, run by Britain's Royal Navy and defence company Kinetic, put the latest technology to the test. Scientists and technicians in a high security defence facility. Military equipment can be developed in places like this, but Exercise Unmanned Warrior wanted to give them a thorough examination. Unmanned Warrior is uh, the largest experiment of unmanned vehicles ever to be conducted anywhere in the world. It really is testing networked underwater, above water and aerial vehicles for the first time, blending commercial technologies and industrial technologies with a real operational warfighting environment. That environment is Butech, the British Underwater Test and Evaluation Centre off the north of Scotland. It's a monitored sea area that can measure how vehicles beneath the surface perform in the real world. It is a pretty challenging environment. We have the ability to bring uh, the warfighter and the technology together in an, uh, an instrumented and safe environment so we can bring threat and technology and people together and really test that in this uniquely instrumented but also quite harsh natural environment. So what do the international militaries who are taking part want from this? We asked a man with a rather brilliant job. My name is Commander Peter Pipkin, I'm the Fleet Robotics Officer in the Royal Navy. I have the privileged position of being able to explore technologies such as robotics and autonomy. It's an opportunity for us in defence to have a look and work out whether we can exploit them more rapidly. One of the things we've been able to do here in Unmanned Warrior up in the Kyle of Lockhouse specifically is bring all of those systems in the air, surface and subsurface environments together 
One of the world firsts that we've seen up here in Unmanned Warrior is that multi-teaming of unmanned systems. Uh, and we've been using unmanned underwater vehicles, surface vehicles and air vehicles. So 10 systems have, have achieved a, a level of collaborative autonomy that just hasn't been seen anywhere before. That isn't just operating in the same airspace or water space. It is actually talking amongst themselves, working out what their tasking is and how they best operate uh, to achieve their tasking, all without having the intervention of an operator. Among the things being tested was just how autonomous unmanned vehicles can be. For Unmanned Warrior Mine Countermeasures, we have aimed to demonstrate how you can have unmanned vehicles all working collaboratively, having been set a goal. Now what does that mean? It means they're thinking for themselves. We tell them an area we want them to clear. They will work out how to best to achieve that mission. They will then go and collaborate together through the autonomy software that's loaded on each of those vehicles and allow the operators to sit back and monitor uh, the mission. What you see here on the display is actually one of those missions and this was a world first. It's the first multi-squad, multinational uh, unmanned systems operating in both the air, surface and undersea domains. We have an unmanned air vehicle that launched from the shore, went into its first orbit, then a second, and is now positioned over a number of other assets. These two contacts you see here are the unmanned surface vessels, which in turn are conducting their mine hunting missions with towed sonars, and they're talking through acoustic comms to these two underwater vehicles who are using their side scan sonars to conduct a mine hunting mission. It's proved uh, that these systems can achieve this level of autonomy. We're seeing some very interesting behaviours. For example, if an underwater vehicle becomes caught in some obstruction or fails to communicate, one of the other vehicles will then come and pick up its task because it realises it's been set a goal. Somehow between all these assets they need to complete it without the operator being involved. This UV has identified a target. Um, once it's identified that, if it's still got more work to do, it can call another underwater vehicle across to investigate. Outside, the Royal Navy's Fleet Hydrographic and Meteorology Unit were hauling one of the other unmanned vehicles from the water, carefully. So this is probably one of the hardest bits now. As we lower it, we just need to make sure that we've lined up all the sensors because we, again, the really expensive, the really fragile bits are the sensors. They're all on the bottom. So we just want to make sure we, we line it up properly because if you were to damage it, it's a big job to fix them. And they're the main part of the vehicle. That's the whole reason that vehicle goes in the water. It's because of those sensors, so we need to look after them. So starting at the front of the vehicle, and this is actually a line grab system. Again, uh, unique to the 600. We don't have it on the smaller vehicles because, uh, because this is actually a recovery system. What happens is you have an ultra short baseline um, transponder here and that will ping to another transponder and that will hone in onto a recovery system. You've got a latch here that will then uh, latch onto a line and then you can recover and haul in the vehicle without any, um, any human operator having to get involved and get his hands on the, the system, potentially injure himself. So that's quite a good feature of this. Second thing we've got here, this is the EM3002. This is probably the main sensor on this vehicle. So that is a bathymetric sonar. What that does is that maps the seabed and from that you can create charts um, and other bathymetric layers so people can then safely navigate through that area. And that's what we've been doing for the past five weeks. Um, the, the mobile survey team from FHMU, that's what um, myself and the guys have been doing here. Uh, moving on, this is a side scan bar. There's another one on the other side as well. It's an edge tech side scan sonar. So we use that uh, to create imagery of the, of the uh, seabed. So looking for sea mounts, navigational hazards, um, but also you can use it to look for mines as well. So it's quite a diverse um, vehicle that we've got here at the moment. And then moving back, a differential GPS aerial that you can see here. Probably the most, one of the most fragile parts of the vehicle. Um, that's probably the bit that's most likely to be damaged in the recovery. Happily, it hasn't been. Um, you've also got uh, the fins and the control fins itself, the propulsor that makes it go. Uh, and the final thing as well, so that's a modem, modem burst happening at the moment. That's what we use to communicate with the vehicle once it's under the water. Um, so it just means that we're in control of it at all times. We know exactly where it is. 
um, because it's sending back its position to, to the operators and controllers. So at all times, absolutely, absolutely control. We can surface that vehicle at any point if we needed to. Back in the lab, some of the scientists demonstrated that Unmanned Warrior was about development as well as capability. So what we've got here are two Ivor three unmanned underwater vehicles. And Defence R&D Canada, or DRDC, uses them as uh, testbed platforms for vetting different algorithms, testing different concepts of operations. You could do rapid prototyping with them. And the idea is that eventually the uh, smarts that we develop on these vehicles could be ported over to the working class vehicles. The above water mass is used to help us with um, getting a GPS fix to recalibrate its position. So when you're dead reckoning underwater for an extended time period, you can accumulate a fair amount of um, a long track and cross track error. And what that means is the UUV won't know its position very well. So with the mass, you can come up and get a GPS fix and zero your position errors. It's also a way for us to uh, talk to the vehicle without going into the vehicle hull. The unmanned underwater vehicle is there as a platform or a pickup truck to take the sensor to where it needs to be to image the sea bottom as we require it. Okay, so the important payload sensor for us here is the Klein 3500 side scan sonar that we use to image what's on the seabed to a fairly high fidelity and a good range. It's one of the state of the art uh, side scan sonars. So with the other Ivor 3 in the back, it's got two masts. Uh, the additional mast here is, is to give us another radio it's for communications at extended range, so beyond Wi-Fi range above water. So scientists and academics at the cutting edge. International military personnel working together and international companies cooperating. Exercise Unmanned Warrior seems to have gone well. It's a huge demonstration of the art of the possible if we can just get these people collaborating, testing things, not being scared of sharing, not feeling that they're competing with each other. And I think that's at the heart of what we've achieved here, really, and in showing what we can do with this technology. One of the things that we've learned in Unmanned Warrior is just how powerful that the visual element of demonstration has been actually bringing the systems up and pushing them beyond the limits that you would normally see for a, for a concept or capability demonstration. If there's one thing we take away, it will be the value in doing that. And I think there'll be other technologies where we as Defence, and certainly in the Royal Navy, will want to do more of that in future. Well, that's it for part one, but still to come, we'll show you how the borders of the future will be watched. There's the Russian tank that could be the world's first fifth generation war machine and the high-tech material that's not sheepish about how it can help soldiers. Hello, welcome back to the Military Tech Show where we spotlight the equipment that could change how wars are fought. Now, the armies, navies and air forces of the world know all too well that what troops wear can be a key factor in how they perform. Most military base layers are made from nylon, but some manufacturers are looking at more natural fibres and some of the world's leading special forces already have the clothes on order. If I was a scientist and I wanted to invent a new fibre, I would like to have a fibre that keeps keep me warm uh, when it's cold, keep me cool when it's uh, warm. Uh, it protects me from the UV, it protects me from fire, so it doesn't burn. A fiber that does not smell, a fiber that cannot be attacked by the seawater, um, a fiber that has got elasticity. Uh, at the end, if I was a scientist, this fiber is already existing and is wool. So wool might be a wonder fabric, but why does it matter to the military? We established Armadillo Marina in 2011 in response to seeing some of the injuries being inflicted on US soldiers in Iraq and, and more recently in Afghanistan. And what was happening was the IEDs would melt the synthetic garments that they were wearing next to skin. So we're recognising the inherent flame-resistant properties of, of merino wool. We felt that we should be offering it to professionals who are working in high-risk environments. The beauty of merino is no melt, no drip, and it's flame resistant up to 600 degrees centigrade. 
if you look at it in comparison, cotton is flammable at about 260 degrees. And if you look at nylon, it melts at 160 degrees centigrade, which is actually very low. So it just needs a short burst of heat to melt and drip into the skin. So it's a potentially a very dangerous fabric to be wearing next to the body. Wool as a fibre is micron for micron. It's stronger than steel. But it also has the ability to withstand bending, bending and twisting. So you can bend and twist a, a merino fibre 30,000 times, it won't break. But how do you turn what is a natural layer of protection for some into a product fit for the military? Reader, based in northern Italy, supplies the high quality wool to Armadillo. This is where the wool arrives. Um, shipped from Australia and New Zealand into the storage facility here and this is the beginning of the manufacturing process. So what we've got here are the bales of greasy wool which have been emptied out to go through the opening up process. Here we've got the wool once it's been mixed, it's going through a constant process of blending and mixing before it goes down into large hoppers where it'll be mixed again. We're now coming into the washing stage. So this is, this is a really important stage because what we're doing is removing all the dust and contaminants, all the impurities out of the wool fibre. As you can see here, it's much, much cleaner now. So we've removed all the contaminants out. This is the last time that it'll be washed before it goes into the drying process. After the wool is dried, it's dyed and taken to a controlled environment to be blended for the final time. We use a compact spun yarn and this is using air technology to suck the long fibres into the core of the yarn which gives it a much stronger, more hard wearing, more durable effect when it goes into the fabric. The material is spun and then weaved using these giant knitting machines. During the next stage the product really takes its shape. So we now come into the laser cutting room and this is where we use laser technology to lay the fabric out and relax it and then we run the laser cutter over it so it's a, it gives a very clean cut and it's very efficient in terms of the utilisation of fabric. And this is the cut and sew, so this is where the garments are finally sewn together. We use a super strong thread to give longevity to the garments. So we take all the different parts to the, that have been cut out from the laser cutting room and we join them together here to create the finished armadillo garment. But what other benefits are there to the military when using the garment in the harshest conditions? Merino provides broad spectrum UVA and UVB protection, so it can be worn in environments where there's high solar activity, uh, you can, particularly in the desert, but also in the Arctic where you have a lot more exposure to the ozone. The other area of protection that Merino offers is anti-static, so it doesn't have a static discharge, either at a positive or negative, so it means that you can use it around refuelling stations or around sensitive computer equipment without the risk of a static discharge. Merino's got natural water repellency. By wearing Armadillo, it delays the onset of sweating by up to 50%. You can wear this product for a week and there's no odour produced. As you're perspiring, it will absorb moisture firstly as a vapour and then secondly as a liquid. But if you're in a high sweat environment, it will absorb it into the core of the yarn and it will feel dry to touch. So you can add up to 35% of the weight of the garment as sweat and it'll still feel dry to touch. When it absorbs the moisture, there's a chemical reaction that takes place and it releases a small but discerning amount of heat, which helps to warm the body. So it means that you can go from a, a sweat situation to a standing position without chilling. You can wear it in high humid conditions and you can wear it where it's pouring with rain and not get cold. Despite an ever-changing world, tanks are still key pieces of equipment for the world's biggest armies. In the race to develop the best armoured war machines, Russia is claiming to be ahead with the T-14 Armata. Well, they say it's the world's first fifth-generation tank. This is the T-14 Armata tank, Russia's latest and most advanced armoured battle tank. Manufacturers Ural Vagonzavod say it's the world's first fifth-generation tank. It has a 125mm smooth bore cannon. The 2A821M can fire a shell every five seconds. And those 12 rounds a minute can hit targets up to eight kilometres away. The main gun is complemented by a 7.62mm remote controlled machine gun on the turret. 
All three of the tank's crew members sit and work inside an armoured capsule at the front. It means they never have to be visible outside of the tank. None of them ever go in the turret, which contains an automatic loader for the main gun that can hold 32 rounds. All of the equipment is moved around by a 12-cylinder supercharged gas turbine engine. It has more horsepower than a Bugatti Veyron and can reach speeds of 90 kilometers per hour. Protecting the tank is a defense system that can detect incoming projectiles and launch an interceptor rocket to destroy them. Surrounding it is a suite of high-resolution cameras, where they give the Armata operators a 360-degree view around the vehicle. The Russians are expected to order more than 2,000 T-14s. They've already started military tests. Watching long stretches of fence lines on borders and at secure installations is a huge challenge. Humans in existing sensors can watch small areas but struggle with much more than that. The manufacturers, though, of a new system claim that their groundbreaking sensing technology could change border security forever. Borders and fence lines. Watching them closely from either side has always used huge amounts of manpower and resource. In the modern era, the need to monitor hard-to-reach areas over tough terrain can make them almost impossible to police. But as I find out in Paris, new technology may be able to offer a solution. This little box of tricks here is the supervisor. It's a wide area persistent surveillance system. It looks a little bit like a speed camera, but it's way cooler than that. Uh, Offer can take me through it. Offer, talk me through. How does it work? What is it? This is a wide area persistent surveillance system, meaning that we have one sensor that covers a very wide area of 90 degrees over 12.5, panoramic picture of 50 megapixel. It doesn't look what we are calling a soda strobe that is a very narrow field of view, so you might miss things that happen in this field. You said soda straw, like, like looking through a straw, basically. Yeah, it's a very narrow field of view. So what are the applications? Um, if it was being used, what do people see? How do they use it? Actually, the system was developed in order to give you a solution for a, a perimeter um, protection, a sensitive infrastructure protection, border control, everywhere that you need to uh, find someone that is trying to get into without, his, without the permission. And it's specially designed for places where you, you don't have any fences, for example. This uh, system was designed in order to be like what we are calling a virtual fence, if you would like to protect perimeters, borders, and you cannot put a fence and you can don't have the manpower, you can put this system, which is automatically detect everything that moves within this field of view. Anything that moves, the system will detect it. So if a vehicle is coming into that field of view, what happens? This machine picks it up and then what happens? Exactly. As you said, if a vehicle is coming, the system is first of all is thermal, IR, meaning it works day and night, it doesn't care. It works 24-7. So if a vehicle is coming, the system automatically detects it. It will detect any pixel that moves within this field of view. It will give you alert. You, as a decision maker, can decide, and to, um, decide whether this vehicle is a threat or not. If yes, if you suspect this vehicle, you mark it, and the system automatically opens a window, ROI, region of interest, and continue tracking the, the vehicle and then you can decide what would you like to do with this information. And how many um, targets, so to speak, can it track? How many vehicles could it watch? The system can monitor all targets. It doesn't, ma it doesn't matter how many, but it can continue tracking up to 10 targets in the same time while you are still watching the panoramic picture. And, and just vehicles, do they have, does it have to be that big, just on the ground? Or? No, actually everything. A vehicle, a UAV, a drone, a person, everything. Every pixel that moves within this field of view, the system will automatically detect it. And that's it for this week. Hope you enjoyed the programme. Bye for now.